our, our next speaker is uh, Xavier Rosoton from the University of Zurich. He will uh, speak about genetic regularity in free boundary problems. Xavier is uh, well known for all of us, most of us, because he, he was a student here, both uh, as an undergraduate and then um, for the PhD. Uh, and uh, if I have, uh, well, I can say, I cannot say many things because we don't have time, but there are many things to be said about him. He's also an outstanding young researcher. And um, if I have to say two words as keywords of his research, my choice would be uh, regularity up to the boundary and uh, regularity off the boundary, which are two different boundaries. One is the boundary of the domain and the other is the boundary of a, of a free boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ones we said, uh, I said uh, this, this work is enjoying work with Alessio Ficali and Joaquin Serra, and we will see it later. So. 
Okay, so let me start. So the basic question, I mean, the, the, may have, most of my researcher would say could, you could uh, summarize it as like you have this kind of question. So you have a PD, I mean, or a class of PDs, and then you want to answer this question. So are, are all solutions to this even PD smooth, or they may have singularities? Okay, so this is the, the kind of regularity question that we want to answer. Okay, so and then the oldest example of this maybe is the Hilbert 19 problem. Okay, so it was in uh, more than a century ago that Hilbert posed a list of 23 problems, and one of them was this. Okay, and basically you consider uh, minimizers so of a convex energy function. So U is a solution, <coughs> the, an n by of and we are in a brain, and then we have a domain and maybe some boundary data, and then you minimize this function. Okay, where L it's convex and I mean it's a, it's a uniformly convex. It's a convex function. Okay, so this will, will have a minimizer, and the minimizer will be uh, a solution u, which is equal to g on the boundary, on the boundary, and, and it's minimizing this kind of energy. Okay, you have a convex energy, you minimize, you find a minimizer, and then uh, what? What? Uh, I mean, the mo main point here is that the minimizer of a convex energy functional will solve an elliptic PD, a nonlinear elliptic PD. Okay, so this is the, the the setting, we, we want to co minimize convex energy functionals, which is equivalent to understanding uh, nonlinear elliptic that are variation. They come from a calculus of variations, okay? in the sense that you, they are obtained by minimizing a function. Okay? And then the, the, this nonlinear elliptic PD, in a sense, the question here, which was the question posed by Hilbert, uh, is well, say, say that L, so this thing here, and like this function here, L is smooth and uniformly complex. Okay, and then it's easy to prove that you have a unique minimizer and so on. But then the question is, can you prove that this minimizer uh, is smooth? So is this solution to this uh, nonlinear elliptic PD always symphony or not? Okay, this was the question. Because a priori, when you construct uh, solutions of existence, in the sense of existence of solution, you prove that the solution is such that the gradient of U is in L2, basically. Okay, this is the only information you have. And then you want to prove that a uh, solution should be maybe simpinity. Okay, because when L, so when L of grad U is just <laughs> gradient squared, then this is called the Dirichlet energy. And then what you get is not a, is a linear elliptic relief because you get harmonic functions. You get just the Laplace, basically. Okay, so this is the only case in which you get that linear one, basically. And, and then in this case, it is known that if you minimize gradient U squared, then you get harmonic functions, and harmonic functions are simpinity. Okay? And then Gilbert and this question was, okay, is this something very particular about the Laplacian, or this is a more general phenomenon that when we consider uh, elliptic PDs, even if they are nonlinear, they come from minimizing general energy functions like this, are all solutions smooth? Okay? And this is the people's main question. And then, so the first results in this direction were established by Schauder. Basically, the, with Schauder estimates, one can prove that if u is c1, so if you have, remember that the, the only regularity we know is that the gradient of u is in L2, okay? So this assumption is saying, okay, if the gradient is actually continuous, then solutions are simply okay? So if you have some initial regularity, you assume more than what you have, but if you have some initial regularity, c1, then you get simply okay? And these, 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 are, these results are, in a sense, perturbative. You, you, you kind of linearize the equation, I mean, you, you use results for linear equations to get something, I mean, a new theorem for nonlinear ones. Okay, so this is uh, a part of the theory that is the, the linear part, in a sense. And, and what the linear theory allows you to prove you, allows you to prove is that if u is c1, then it is c3. And then comes the difficult part. I mean, the open problem was, okay, I know that if the gradient is continuous, then I'm done, but I only know that the gradient is in L2. And that's the main question. That's a, like the non real hard question that was the nonlinear equation. Okay? And then this <laughs> took uh, two outstanding young mathematicians, that was the Georgie and Nash, who independently and basically at the same time, was first the Georgie and a few months uh, later Nash, but they didn't know about each other and the proofs are different, so they, this is called the, the Georgie-Nash theorem nowadays. Uh, so in the 50s, so more than, it took more than 50 years to answer the question of, of Hilbert, they proved that actually, yes, so solutions are always C1, and therefore C3. Okay? So this is a very uh, classical 
problem, which is still a deep problem, and you should keep this idea in mind. That the question is about regularity, and then it has like two parts in a sense. The, the, the one that you can solve with linear methods, and the really difficult and nonlinear ones. Okay? And they were, I mean, both of them are like the Georgie that we already mentioned, uh, the Georgie before. I mean, he was very young at that time, an Italian mathematician that later won the World Prize. I mean, it's really like one of the best analysts of the 20th century. And then Nash also, you probably know, I mean, you've heard of him, and then he won the Abel Prize later. And he was also very, very young at that time. So they were very young mathematicians who solved, uh, completely solved this problem. Okay. Now let me give a second example, a bit more, uh, because, so in this case, the answer is yes, basically, right? That, that are all solutions smooth, or they may have singularities? Well, here, all solutions are smooth. So let me give you another example, okay, for elliptic PDs. So nonlinear elliptic PDs. So if you take the most general uh, elliptic PD, it would be something like this. So a, a function of the second derivative, and maybe first derivative, u itself, or x, so this would be like the most general elliptic PD, second order elliptic PD, yeah. And, and then basically to understand this, it's, it's sufficient to understand this one. Okay, so this is like the cleanest case, but basically if you understand the normality for this equation, you will understand it for this. Okay, let me not get into details. So we want to understand what happens with this kind of equations. Okay, and then the question is the same. Are all solutions smooth? So if I have a solution to this, is it necessarily simplicity if f is uniformly elliptic and smooth? Or there might be singularities, okay? So this is the analogous of Hilbert 19th problem, but for fully nonlinear equations. And then in this case, uh, again, the first results were in the first half of the 20th century, but also basically Schalder estimates, okay? And then you get a result like this. So this is by using linear, uh, so results for linear equations. You get basically something like this, that if the solution is C2, then it's infinity. Okay, so this equation in a sense is more nonlinear than the one before, so that's why you need U to be C2. Okay? And then if U is C2, then it is infinity. Okay? And this is the, the linear part. And this is, in a sense, same ideas as on the, the Hilbert and D problem, but a bit different. And, and now it comes the, the, the nonlinear part, right? Because when we construct solutions to this, then they are only continuous. Basically, so we can prove we can prove that this this equation with some boundary data has a unique solution and it is continuous, okay? But then you want to say, okay, there is a gap between being continuous and being C two. So can I fill this gap, which is a really nonlinear part, or not? Okay. And then Nierberg was an advisor of, of Sergei Cabré, and then was also I think was also the person who introduced the problem to Nash, the previous person. I mean the previous. Uh, human and the problem, he the problem tonight, and then I solved it. I mean, he also won the Abel Prize uh, a few years ago. So, he didn't introduce the problem. Nash okay. came knowing the problem. Ah, okay. Nierberg gave him like a three hours in introduction to PDs because he had no idea of PDs. Okay. <laughs> before, before the summer. And after the summer, he came and, was and said near, to Nierberg, I think I solved the problem. <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> so, Nirenberg himself was an outstanding mathematician, and he won the Abel Prize for his many contributions to, to BDEs. And then in particular, one of the things that he proved very early in the 50s, it was that uh, in R2, so in dimension two, if you take any equation like this, or even like this, any equation, any fully nonlinear equation, uh, solutions will be C2, and therefore C infinity. So the answer in 2D is yes, all solutions are simplicity. Nothing else can happen. Okay? And then, well, the next question is what happens in higher dimensions? Well, in higher dimensions, there was a field of Safonov. Okay, so there were two uh, very good mathematicians from the Soviet Union that they proved in 79 with a, in a sense, with this, this extends, this in the same spirit as the theorem of the Georgian Nash. Okay, and they proved that for this nonlinear equation, solutions are C1. Okay, so they are not only C1 alpha, I'm sure, but say C1. Okay, so they proved that for using the, the just this nonlinear equation, uh, you can prove that solutions are C1. Okay, now in Hilbert and D problem, C1 is enough to get to infinity. Here we have a problem because 
still C1 does not imply C2. I mean, there, there, there is this gap still between C1 and C2 that has to be filled, right? So you, ca you can have a nonlinear result, which is saying that any solution is C1, which is nice, and then the perturbative result, the linear result, that tells you that C2 implies infinity, okay? But then there's still the gap. So what happens with this gap? And then Evans and Krilov independently, so he's in the US, and he was in, in Russia, or in the Soviet Union at that time, and then independently at, at the same time, they proved the following theorem, that if F is convex, so if, if this F here of the patient, if this F is convex or concave, I mean, it's the, uh, then the solutions are always C2, and therefore C2. So with an additional assumption on F, which is actually natural because this F being convex is an assumption that appears in probability when people in probability study this kind of equations, but okay. So if F is convex, then solutions are always C2, okay? And therefore, when F is convex, then the answer is also yes. So all solutions are smooth, and then nothing else can happen, okay? But then, okay, for many, many years, I mean, for, for well, basically for decades, for more than 20 years, this was an open problem to try to prove that this extends to the case in which F is non-convex, okay? So can you, to prove the same result that solutions are always C2 in case where F is non-convex, but then, in 2008, the first counter examples came. So it was a surprise that to, to many people, I think, that uh, Nadia Ivili and Ladud, they could prove, uh, they could construct counter examples to this. So they could construct homogeneous solutions in dimensions five or higher, in which solutions are not C2. They are C1, but not C2, and they are homogeneous. So they are homogeneous, obviously, between one or two. Or basically, I think they are two homogeneous. Okay, so they are not C2, uh, in particular, not infinity, and they are solutions to this equation, and they exist in dimension n bigger equal than five. Okay, so there are similarities. So we have a very clear example of a nonlinear, <coughs> uniformly elliptic PD with, in which f is smooth. Okay, but similarities do appear. Okay, so this means that there are solutions that are similar in this sense, in the sense that they are not in the system. Okay, and then of course I said in 2D this happens. In dimensions five or higher, this happens, and then it is still an open question to understand what happens in 3D or 4D. Actually. Okay, so we have no idea of what happens in these two dimensions. So basically, what they proved is that their counterexamples, their kind of counterexamples, cannot be constructed in 3D or 4D. But this doesn't mean that there cannot be other counterexamples. Or I mean, I think that basically people don't have an idea of what should happen here. Okay. Yeah, this is like an outstanding open problem in elliptic TVs. I would say this is, yeah, like, this is very important open problem. Okay, so this was just to give an idea of the kind of questions in which we work. Okay, I will, and then my title, if you remember, the title of the talk was generic regularity on free boundary <coughs> problems. So I will explain in the next slide, starting on next slide, that we'll talk only about free boundary problems. Then explain what I mean by generic regularity. So for example, a generic regularity theorem here that nothing like that is known. In this context, but a generic regularity theorem here would be like: Can you prove, for example, this is also an open problem here? Can you prove that even if singular solutions can exist, so there are solutions that are not infinity, can you prove that they are really like probability zero? That when you take a generic boundary data, you like you have one boundary data which is singular, okay, but maybe for most boundary data, solutions are smooth, and it's just that one very particular boundary data that you chose is singular, right? So we don't know. If this happens often, I mean, if this singularity happens often, or if they really are very rare. Okay, so this is the, the question of generic regularity in a sense. How often or how likely it is to have singularities? Okay, so this would be the question here, and it's the question that we will have later for free boundaries. Okay, so let me now talk about free boundary problems. So, what is the kind of uh, problems in which uh, we work? Okay, so uh, a free boundary problem is basically, I mean, roughly speaking, free boundary problems are those in which you have a PDE, okay, but in addition to the PDE, you have a, a free interface. So you have like a, the domain in which the PDE is solved, in a sense, is also free, is also unknown, okay? So uh, one typical example, I mean, they appear in a variety of areas, I mean, they, they, I will give some examples later, but basically the most classical example, and one good way to think about it is the Stefan problem, okay, which is 
the center is a goal, basically, and it describes the melting of ice. So if you think of the melting of ice, you will have a picture like this. Okay, say that you have a PD here inside, and then some boundary conditions. This would be the usual thing to have. Okay, but if you are modeling phase transitions like ice melting to water, then you have also a pre boundary, which is saying that here you have water, and then you have the heat equation if you want. Okay, and then here you have the ice. Say it's at zero degrees. Okay, to simplify the ice at zero degrees, and then. In addition to the PDE, you also have this interface, which is the interface between liquid and solid. And then you have to model, I mean, you, have, you need an equation also to see how this thing evolves. This is more like a geometric flow in a sense. I mean, this is something which is a, a surface here. This surface is evolving with time in a way that it's also unknown. It's also part of the problem. Okay, so that, that's why it's called a pre boundary. Okay, so there are many kinds of, of problems and models in which three boundary columns appear. So you have PDEs mixed with uh, an unknown moving boundary. Okay? And the classical, I mean, the most classical example is Stefan Fleck. So if we want to give some PDEs here, if I denote theta to be the temperature at point x and time t, then I will have the heat equation here in the liquid water. Okay? So I just say that everything is, I mean, there is no fluid flow or anything. I mean, everything is just, I want to model the temperature. Okay? So here I have the heat equation okay, in the liquid part. So when theta is positive, which is the water, I mean the liquid water part, I just have the heat equation. This looks simple. Okay? But the problem is that I don't know what is this set. Okay? So that's why the problem is very nonlinear. And then the free boundary, the evolution of the moving boundary, okay, of the free boundary, is given by this. Okay? Which basically is saying that the more gradient you have in space, the faster the free boundary will move. Okay? So the more the temperature is zero, but then if the gradient is higher, then it will melt faster. This is very reasonable. Okay, this is what this equation means. And this equation is on the free boundary. Okay? And then there is a way to change these two conditions because they are like separate conditions. We like to put it this way. So you consider u to be the integral in time of the temperature, and then the nice thing is that this u solves one single PD. Okay, that you can write it this way. Okay, and then this is a characteristic function of the, the set where u is positive that is unknown, so this set is also part of the problem, so that's why the problem is very nonlinear. Okay, so this looks like uh, simple, but it's not. So that this, this problem is quite uh, nonlinear and difficult to understand. But the good thing about this is that when written in this way, the existence of uniqueness of solution, for example, is very easy to do. Okay, then the problem is again regular. Okay? So, uh, the stationary version of this is basically equivalent to the obstacle problem. What is the obstacle problem and why we call it like that? Well, basically, you minimize the Dirichlet energy, okay, which is the energy you minimize to get harmonic functions, but then you minimize these solutions, I mean these functions, with a constraint, which is, okay, let me minimize this, but I cannot take all solutions. I fix the boundary data and I minimize with a constraint. I say that my solution, V, okay, this should be a V, is, needs to be above a given obstacle phi. So, it's like, you can think of it as like, you get some boundary data somewhere and you put it as a membrane here on top. Okay, this is fixed, and this is a V that is unknown. Okay, and this is a minimization problem. It is very easy to say that, I mean, to prove that there is a unique minimizer. Okay, and then the, the minimizer, I call it V. And, and then it will solve this kind of equation. So V is always bigger equal than phi. Uh, the, the function is harmonic whenever it is positive, so here it's harmonic. And then the gradient must coincide here. <coughs> This is what you can prove easily. And then this V, I consider just V minus phi, and basically I call it U, and then we will see that this U solves basically the same problem as before, but in the stationary version. So this U will satisfy that it's not negative everywhere, and the Laplacian is equal to the characteristic function of U positive, which is the same equation we had before, but without time. So it's really like the stationary version of the Stefan problem, basically. Okay? And then, as I said before, here we have two unknowns, the solution and this region, which in the evolutionary case is the ice, in a sense, right? Here, I cannot say it's ice because it's really the obstacle, I mean, the part of in which the U is equal to zero, but that's, you can think of it as like the, the ice region where it's zero, and then where the region where U is positive, and then the Laplacian is one. Okay, so, this, the, and these two things are the unknown, the U and the set. So that's why the problem is difficult. So the set a priori, I mean, here I'm picturing this set as if it was very small, <coughs> right? I mean, but I have no idea of how this set looks like. It would be like a fractal, a counter set, could be anything a priori, because I didn't prove anything so far. Okay? 
But this is a simple looking problem that we have to analyze. Okay, and this is the, the, the object of a lot of work in, in the last decades. Okay, to, to understand second problem and obstacle problem, and we'll see in a second. Okay? So this kind of problem, so let me just motivate why do we care about such a particular problem, right? I mean, the, the, it looks like a, we are doing one problem, but it turns out that this problem appears in many, many places. So first, in, in very classical problems in potential theory, this problem already appears, but if you want that function that is Laplacian equals one here, it's zero here, and the gradient vanishes here. These are already appears, I think, even in the work of, of Dirichlet, okay? But even in the 20s in potential theory, I mean, people have studied this for a long, long time. Uh, then in probability theory, also when you consider the optimal solving problem, so you have like a Brownian motion, and then you want to say, well, I have a control on this Brownian motion that I can say, you stop now, and then I get some money, say, at the, depending on the point you stop. And then the, the question of optimal stopping is, where should I stop when I'm passing through a region or not? Okay? And then this turns out to be equivalent to the obstacle problem. Okay? So when you study optimal stopping, it gives you a free boundary problem, which is actually the obstacle problem. Uh, then also when you study fluid filtration through a porous material, so you have a, a dam, okay, so you have two water reservoirs maybe, and then a dam here, and then this this por this uh, dam is like porous, and then we we'll have like a shape, the water, I mean the filtration of water, we we'll have kind of shape, and then it turns out this is also a solution to the optical problem. Or if you have phase transitions like the Stefan problem, these are already explained. This, this can be seen as the evolutionary version of the optical problem. In fluid mechanics, here you show Okay, so you have the flow between two thin parallel plates and you want to see how this thing is moving, then it turns out for every fixed time, it's a solution to the obstacle problem. Or when you have like electrons, it is worked by Sylvia Serpati, for example, it, say that you have a bunch of electrons uh, and then you have a confining potential that is keeping them together, and then you don't know much about this potential, it's just confining them, and then these electrons turns out they will have some, I mean the region, there will be some shape in which they accumulate and then they are zero. Otherwise, and this shape is also the solution to the optical problem. Okay, so then uh, in pricing of American options, so this is because simply the guys on finance use optimal stopping models. Right? So this is the same as this, but basically you can say this is probability or this is finance. I mean, this is just the same. Uh, and then also like work of San Antonio Carrillo, who has also been mentioned before, uh, they have some words in interacting particle systems that appear, for example, in biology, and it's similar to this thing about electrons. You have like particles that interact with each other, and then you have some kind, I mean, they, they repel each other when they are close, but uh, they attract each other when they are far, and then they, you have some shape, and then this shape is also a solution to the obstacle problem. I mean, you have many, many problems here in random matrices. So in all these examples, give the obstacle problem. So that's why we care uh, a lot about this kind of, of free boundary problems, okay? Life has obstacles, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, this is the problem we want to study. What are the mathematical questions here? Well, uh, the, the, the main mathematical question that, that we study is this. So, is the free boundary smooth? Okay, this is a, the analogous of the question of regularity before, but before it was for solutions, now it's for free boundaries. So, what we want to answer is, can you say that the free boundary, this set, is a nice set? Is it smooth or not? Okay. And then the first results was, uh, were basically in the 60s and 70s, and they were uh, concerning the regularity of solutions. This turns out to be much easier. Okay, so this in like half a page you can prove this, that the solution is C11, which means that it's not C2, but almost. So all second derivatives are bounded, but they are not continuous. And this is the best you can show. Okay. This is actually fairly easy to prove. Okay? But then the question is, is the free boundary smooth? Okay? Or not? Because this, even if you know that the solution is smooth, it implies nothing on the free boundary. This is the prestige result. No, it was actually Fred's set. Fred's, yes, what I did before, yeah. But, so, I, maybe Brazil proved it for a much more general class of operators, I don't know. There were several, okay. several works. What? Did that was Yes, yes, and then it implies that the three boundary has like finite measure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So at that time, there were many, many, like, top people working on this kind of problem, like Brazil, Levy, Stampakia, Middenberg, I mean, we were really trying very hard to, to understand what happens with these free boundary problems, right? Hmm? Yeah. So it was in the 60s, basically. And then in the 70s, as you know, more people 
uh, came when young people started working on this. And so basically, at the same time, in 77, there were they came the, the two main results in this topic. So the first one was by Kinderberger and Middenberg, and they proved that if the free boundary is C1, then it is infinity. So you see this looks like the, the, the results that I said before, that that by uh, using results for linear equations. This is actually more difficult than the ones before, but you can also say that this is basically perturbative theory in the sense that it's using results for linear equations and then applying very wisely here, and then you get this, that if the free boundary is C1, so if you know that the domain is C1, then it is infinity. Okay, so this is the, the, the first part of the theory. Okay, and then for the second part, it was when uh, Caffarelli came. So there was a paper in ACTA that was is very famous, and Caffarelli at that time was actually very young. I don't know how old he was, but... Yeah, in the 20s? Yeah, so 28, 29. So it was, I mean, this was basically the paper that made him most famous, I would say. Uh, and then he proved that actually, so this was the, the this is the really like the nonlinear theory in a sense. So he proved that the free boundary is actually C1 and therefore infinity. Well, but there's a comma, so there's something else coming. So uh, <laughs> possibly outside a certain set of singular points. <laughs> so this could happen, but the theorem of Caffarelli basically says, so either you have this, like something looking like a cast, in a very general sense, or just that the gray part, the gray part is like the eyes, where you have like u equals zero. So the theorem of Caffarelli says either you have something looking like this, in which the gray part has like zero density that you almost you don't see properly at this point, or the free boundary is infinity. So here everything will be infinity, and then you have one singular point here in which you have you have cast. Okay, and this was the theorem of Caffarelli. So this famous theorem, your statement doesn't say that the set is small. What do you say? No, I don't say this. Because it didn't say this in the theory. It says that it has singular, uh, zero, zero density. So zero the density. singular points have zero density. It's not saying that the singular set is small. Actually, we will talk about this later. Okay? Yeah. And, and then, so actually, in the same paper of Caffarelli, he did both the stationary and the evolutionary case. So he also did the same for the Stefan problem. Okay, so for the melting of ice in the, the version that I stated before, he proved the same result, basically. So the same theorem, as I said here, is true for the obstacle problem or for the Stefan problem, and this was by Caffarelli. And actually, last year, so I wanted to say also this, that he got the Shaw Prize, uh, Caffarelli, and then, uh, actually, okay, this is Caffarelli. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Laudatio for the Shaw Prize last year said exactly this, so for his groundbreaking work on PDEs, including creating a theory of regularity for nonlinear equations, and three boundary problems such as the obstacle problem, work that has influenced a whole generation of researchers in the field. So I wanted to say this because I think that all of us, uh, I mean, this last sentence applies to all of us, uh, in the, the five speakers. And uh, it's, so he's also a very nice person that we all know very well. He has been in Austin for like 20 years, more, 21. <laughs> okay. And, and then he's a, yeah, also very good. I mean, he cooks very well. <laughs> so we have him. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, because the name sounds Caffarelli. Uh, Caffarelli sounds Italian, but he's from Argentina, actually. So he's one. From the family, but not him. <laughs> he told me that his best professor uh, in Buenos Aires was Luis, Luis Santalo. Luis Santalo, yes. So who, who was a Catalan mathematician who immigrated to Argentina, and then he was basically in the Argentinian mathematical community who was very important to develop the, the school. Also Cal Calderon was also a professor of Caffarelli. But basically I wanted to say like a, just a special mention about Caffarelli because I think he's very important not only in this field, but also for all of us. And, and then that's the reason why we've been on Austin, I think, at least the, the, maybe not the dynamic system, but the one with PDEs. Uh, that's the reason, I guess, why Alessio came, went to Austin for the first time, and then I went to Austin because Caffarelli and Alessio were there, and then Cabré was also there because of Caffarelli, and then Juan Luis, Mateo, we have been all under him, we have all visiting Austin, and then the person who's there is, is Luis. Okay, so I just wanted to say uh, like, uh, hello to, <laughs> to Caffarelli, so that you all know him. And, Okay, so let's go to the math. So how much time I have? 
Okay. Uh, so, to study the regularity of the free boundary, so remember we have a free boundary that we don't know how it looks like, so in this case we have no initial information in a sense, so it's just the, the set where the function is zero. This could be any mess, I mean, it could be anything here. Okay, and then we want to prove that this set is C1. This is the theorem of coverage. Okay? And then well, to do this, uh, basically you take, so if you have this set where u is zero, okay, this is like the gray part before, and then you want to understand what happens. You take a fixed point, x zero here, okay, and then you zoom in. So this, is, this thing that I'm doing here is you take your solution around a small ball, and then you zoom in, so you receive <laughs> everything to be one. And then this free boundary will look like something different. Okay, so this ball passes to be this ball. You're like zooming in. And this is what you do here. And then what Kafferelli uh, does is to prove that if I do this and I take the limit, as this ball is smaller and smaller, so I keep zooming in more and more. In the limit, I get a global function, which is u0. Okay? And it's a global solution to the optical problem, global profile. Okay? And then the question, but the key difficulty here, so the, the, which is probably the most important step is to classify blow ups. So to say, okay, if I do this and I take the limit, what can happen in the limit? What are the possible options for blow ups? Okay, and then what you have to do is to classify them. And basically what Caffarelli says is, well, unless the point was a singular point, okay, so you have singular points separately, so unless the point was a singular point, what I do, what I get is a 1D function like this. And this is the only thing that can happen. So a, a 1D function in which u is 0 here, and u is basically a parabola here. I mean, it's really a function that, so this is the origin. But the important thing is that the free boundary becomes flat. Okay? And then it's u equals 0. So this is u 0 <coughs> equals 0, and then u 0 positive. And you can classify, but the important thing that I want to say is that this is flat. You get like a half space in which u is 0, a half space in which u is positive. Yes, a global solution that is a blow up. Okay? And it's not a singular. It was not a singular point. Okay. So you have, you need to be the blow up of a solution and to be not a singular point. Okay? And then you get this. This is the only thing that can happen. So in particular, for example, you cannot have like cones, you cannot have weird things, anything else can happen. You get this. And this is very important, the classification of blow ups. And then once you have this, you prove that if in the limit I get this, it means that before doing the limit, you cannot get a very weird thing here. Okay, so that before the limit, the solution had to look like this, which is very close to this profile. So this, this profile was something like this, like zero, and then some kind of parabola like this. Okay, in the limit. So then the second step of the proof, which is also very important, is to prove that if in the limit you are like flat, before the limit, you are like C1, the solution was C1. Okay, slightly before the limit. So in a very tiny ball, you look like this. Like a C1 free bound. Okay, so this is roughly the, the idea of the regularity theory of Caffarelli for this. Of course, this is much more complicated, but let's say that, the, that this is the, the basic idea. Okay, and then what happens to singular points? So, because so far, I only said that singular points are those at which the free boundary has like zero density. But what you would like to say is that, well, are, for example, is this singular set very small? Or because in, in other problems, like in, when you study minimal surfaces in geometry, this, this thing happens that you have a minimal surface, a minimal surface, and it's smooth outside a, a certain singular set, but the singular set is very small. Okay, and then what became clear from the beginning was that by from my example of Schaeffer, actually Schaeffer did all these examples before the theorem of Caffarelli, so he realized that there can be very weird examples, like even in 2D, you could have like infinitely many casts. So you have a cast like this, but then you have like infinitely many casts, and then something else. I mean, these things could happen, okay, in the optical problem, basically, in 2D. And then in 3D, even more, because in 2D, things are simple, right? I mean, in 2D, this is just a curve in the plane. In 3D, you could have more weird things, okay? So there are examples like that. I mean, the singular set basically here would be like a, a kind of a curve. And in this case, this is countable, but you could have also things like these crossing here, points isolated. I mean, you could have things like this. 
Okay, let's say, yeah, yeah, any kind of set contained in a line, for example. By the example of Schaeffer, any kind of set contained in a line is a possible singular set. Okay, so in particular, this sentence is true, which is singular set can be quite bad, let's say. Okay, and then in the positive direction, Gaffarelli proved in 98, so first actually he proved it in 2D, because the 2D case is a bit easier to he proved it with Nestor in the 70s, I think 78 or so, uh, that singular points are contained in an M-1 dimensional C-1 manifold. So if you have a singular set like this, the theorem of Caffarelli tells you, or Caffarelli and Rivieri in 2D, tells you that the singular set is contained in a C-1 uh, curve, for example, little plane, or in higher dimensions, an M-1 dimensional C-1. Manifold. Okay? <coughs> so that's something, at least. I mean, it could be a kind of set containing this, but at least uh, this is the, the best positive result that they could prove at that time. Okay? But in particular, notice that, for example, this curve, I mean, this is saying that this is n minus 1 dimensional, which is of the same size, in a sense, as the regular set. So, a priori, the regular set and the singular set could be as big one of the each other. So, so, it's a bit of a uh, not completely satisfying. <laughs> because uh, basically in other theory, in many other problems, like in geometry or even three boundaries, you have that the singular set is a small, and then you would like this to happen also here. But it doesn't. Okay, so that's life. I mean, there the are obstacles, as I said. <laughs> and, and this cannot be improved, really. I mean, this n minus 1 cannot be improved. Okay? And then, so one year later, Weiss proved that in 2D, actually, I mean, I will not really be, uh, I, mean, I will not talk about this too much, but I want to mention, because there's an important result after that I wanted to say. Uh, so in 2D, Weiss improved the, uh, this. So you can improve the M-1, but you can improve this. Okay? And then Weiss proved that in 2D, the singular set is containing M-1 dimensional C-1 alpha manifold, which is a bit better. Okay? So he improved a bit our understanding of uh, singular points by gaining an alpha. Okay? And then uh, he proved exactly this. And then, much more recently, three years ago, uh, Alessio Pigali and Joaquin Serra proved uh, that outside a, a small set of dimension m minus 3, singular points are contained in a C11 manifold in every dimension. Okay, so you see that singular points, basically, they are saying that singular points are nicer than we thought. So it's not only a C1, or C it's not really a C11 manifold. And it's, if you see the estimates, it's really saying that. Singular points are a bit nicer than you than we than we knew before. Outside a small set of dimension n minus three, and also this n minus three cannot be proved. Okay, so this is very sharp, and and it's giving us more information uh, than we had before. But of course, still this does not improve this n minus one. Here. Okay, so this is in a sense improving the understanding of the singular set, but it's impossible to improve this n minus one a priori. Right, so this motivates. My next question, which is uh, this. So in general, singularities can be quite bad, but they are expected to be rare in this context. Okay, so this is a, a, an important problem in, in, in this field, which is can you prove generic regularity? Okay, so that singularities do happen, and you have all these weird examples of Schaeffer. Okay, but the, to prove generic regularity you would say like, well, can you prove that generically, if you, to, you take a random boundary data, you like shake your boundary data and pick a random one, can you say that singularities really don't appear? Or can you say something better okay, about singular points? And this was uh, this is basically an important problem in non many nonlinear PDs, I would say. And then in, in the case of the obstacle problem, the conjecture of Schaeffer said this. So if Schaeffer had read in these papers where he constructed proper examples, I guess it was difficult for him to construct them because he conjectured this, that singular points should be difficult to construct in a sense. Okay, so that for a generic solution, if you pick a generic solution, you should have no singularities at all, and the free boundary should be simply. Okay, so this was the conjecture of Schaeffer about generic regularity. And basically, we have only one known result in this direction, which is in 2D, and it's by Monod in 2002, so 17 years ago. Monod proved that this conjecture falls in 2D. Okay, so in particular case of 2D, which is like in, like in this picture, that I said that 2D is always a bit simpler because things are well, in the plane and the free boundary is just a curve. So you can uh, do more stuff usually in 2D. But uh, so in this case, monocle proof and it's actually a, a, a very, I mean, it's quite difficult to, I mean, 
the paper is not really like a simple proof. It's, uh, it's, it's quite involved. And then he proved that in 2D, the conjecture is true. OK? But the, and then basically, there are very few results in elliptic PDEs in this direction, in this question of generic regularity. And in particular, nothing is known in higher dimensions for the optical problem. OK? And now what we can do, so in a, so now we will talk about our results. So in a very recent work that, as I said, will be around when the preprint will be available like next week or so, uh, we prove the following. So we prove that, uh, so in a simplified statement, would be this, that Shepard's conjecture holds in a rand for n less or equal than 4. So we prove now, this is not only, so this is the first time that we can pass from 2D in a sense, so we can go to higher dimensions. Okay, we can go to 3D, which is nice because it's also the physical dimension. Many of the models I mentioned uh, concern 3D, I mean the, the physical space, but also other problems uh, concern R X. So it's still interesting to understand higher dimensions. And actually, R4 is also nice, and we can prove R4 by this. I mean, we really need the estimates to be very, very precise to get to R4. Okay, and then more precisely, so let me say also what happens in higher dimensions. So this solves this completely set of the conjecture in 3D and 4D. And then in higher dimensions, can we prove something, something, I mean, even a, a theorem? And then the answer is yes. And I like it very much also because this says, I mean, here I'm being just more precise. So this is just take a generic solution. So it's like you take a family of solutions indexed with a parameter t. So ut is a solution with a parameter. And then it's just I'm taking, yeah, exactly, it's not a time derivative <laughs> as it was before. Here it's really a parameter. Uh, and then you take the boundary data, which is just increasing in any way you want, but just an increasing boundary data. Then for almost every p, so this is saying like really like almost every solution uh, satisfies the following, which is that the singular set for ut, the singular set is called sigma t, satisfies that the n minus 4 measure, so this is a thousand measure, but this is really a way to, I mean, okay, probably half of you don't know what this means, but it's just a way to measure an n minus 4, the measure of an n minus 4 dimensional set. So in particular, if the measure is zero, it means that the set is n minus four dimensional, and you, mean, you measure it, I mean, the measure is zero. Okay, so in particular, in R4, I mean, if n is four, this set is empty. Okay? So this is a stronger version of this. And this is saying that, in other words, generically, the singular set is very small in all dimensions. Okay, so for the first time, uh, we can prove exactly this theorem that, that you go, you go to higher dimensions that you pick a generic solution, and then the singular set will be n minus four dimensional with measure zero. Okay, so this is a, the the theorem we have. Okay, and it took a lot of a lot of work uh, this time. So it's not. Uh, I mean, we started this I think before I came to Zurich, so we, it was like more than it was probably two years and a half ago, and we've been working on this the three of us for a long, long time. It has created many difficulties, but I mean. Uh, it's like, I mean, the proof of just this theory is like more than 70 pages of it's already. Yeah, like very dense, I'm going to say. But OK. So this is the theorem uh, we can improve, and I think we're very happy about it. And so let me, before finishing, I don't know how much time I have. OK. Uh, then before finishing, let me just give some final comments on the, on the theorem. So basically, the proof is based on several ingredients, but most importantly, we need to improve our understanding of singular points. So we need more than what was known. Okay, so our first half, in a sense, of, of the, the proof is we need to improve our understanding of singular points, okay, in order to prove that generically they don't exist. Okay, but you need to first understand that. And then basically the idea is similar to the paper of, uh, I mean, a first idea that you need is in the spirit of the paper of Alessio Figali and Joaquim Serra that you have different kinds of singular points. You have to separate them. And then some of them will be very nice, but then some of them are not so nice, but then the set is small. So this already appears somehow in, in, in the previous paper, but here we have to take this to, to a much wider extent and separate the singular set in many subsets. And then in this set, we do this. And then in this set, we do this. And then the set one is nice. It has to be even nicer than was known before. I mean, we have to really work a lot in this line of uh, research, in a sense. And then once you have this, this is still not enough to prove the, the generic regularity. So to prove this, I mean, once you have this, I mean, also to, to understand this and to prove the theorem, we basically need all kinds of ingredients. We, can, we take like geometric measure theory tools, 
then we also need like several PD estimates that are very delicate, several dimensional reduction arguments to prove that the sets where the I mean the singular sets that are bad are small. So this involves dimensional reduction arguments that with a family of solutions. I mean this is uh, it's delicate and also new monotonicity formula. So to finding quantities that in this problem that as you zoom in, they remain monotone and then they use very much. I mean, they are very useful. I mean, they help very much in our understanding of, of singular points. Um, and I, also our approach opens the road to study similar questions for other free boundary problems. And in particular, in a future world that we are preparing, we plan to apply all these techniques to the evolutionary version of the problem, the Stefan problem. Okay, so to understand also in the evolutionary setting, in the melting of ice, to uh, prove a kind of similar th uh, a theorem in the same spirit. Okay, now T will be the time parameter. Okay, and then we want to prove something about the singular set. I mean, to understand much better the singular set because it's still. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, things that we don't know about the singular set for the Stefan problem. We plan to to solve this kind of question basically. Okay, so. Uh, I will stop here and thank you very much and thank you Alessia in particular and yeah, so thank you very much.